Good evening. Welcome to uh, the Science Cafe, sponsored by Sigma Xi, the Scientific Honor Society, and the Office of the Vice President for Research. I'm David Ingram, the President of the local chapter of Sigma Xi, and the Chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. We're working toward live captioning the videos for future events. In the meantime, we're uploading the video to YouTube, which we will caption within 24 hours. Anyone who needs further assistance or access is encouraged to contact me. To keep, the, keep up the interactive nature of the cafe, we encourage you to ask questions during the cafe. So this is not a lecture, it's an interactive event. In the audience, just raise your hand and I'll come out with a microphone. Uh, those online uh, can ask their questions through the chat feature. Before I introduce this evening's Science Cafe, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, this will be the one and only Science Cafe for the fall. However, we've already got two planned for spring. Uh, we don't know the dates yet, but uh, they will include Andre Grubu, professor of music, uh, rock and roll, the British invasion, and the globalization of rhythm and blues, and uh, Harvey Ballard, professor of environmental and plant biology, globe trotting for violets. That one sounds really interesting. Anyway, we don't know the dates for those, but uh, stay tuned. There will be dates eventually. Today, we welcome Professor Sarah Wyatt uh, of Environmental and Plant Biology, and she's going to introduce us to Plants in Space. Thank you, David. So, what I promised you guys was an opportunity to follow me and my lab through one of our spaceflight experiments. Um, so, let's fly. Unfortunately, we need to start at the beginning. <laughs> well, probably the biggest question people ask me often is, how do you get a space flight opportunity? And the reality is, it's a grant. Like many of us uh, faculty, we write grants to do our research. This is no different, the grant proposal. Um, some of you know I teach scientific writing, and I tell my students, grant writing is easy. It's not a problem. All you need is a great idea, the right funding agency, and a perfect argument to have them see how brilliant your idea is. Still not sure how I get these things, but. So, grand proposal, the title was Apex 7, Spaceflight Alters Post-Regulation, Post-Transcriptional Regulation. You would think I would know the name of it, wouldn't you? <laughs> So we're going to start with a little bit of the science before we go fly. Central dogma of molecular biology, DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. Done. We are very good as scientists these days about sequencing RNA. And with the idea that RNA serves as a proxy for proteins. However, we know that's not true. There are small RNAs. Nobel Prize in about 2008, uh, seven, somewhere in there, uh, for the discovery of RNA silencing, gene silencing. The idea that transcripts are created, but there are small RNAs that really allow for them to be chewed up. And that may sound wasteful, but actually it's an elegant regulatory system. So not all RNAs go to protein. Jesus God. I apologize. Um, but for an mRNA to be made into a protein, it needs to be associated with a ribosome. That's the translational material. So when RNAs are going to be translated into protein, they are associated with a ribosome. That's where translation occurs. So our idea for spaceflight, one of the things that you have to do is do something that's relatively small and confined, but that you can get a lot of information out of. So as I've said, we're really good at sequencing mRNAs, RNA-seq. For this, we didn't just want RNA-seq. One of my previous experiments, if you talk to some of my lab outside, we did protein analysis. Protein analysis is great, but you don't get all the proteins. 
we wound up getting about, identifying about 5,000 proteins, which isn't even half of the proteins that are expressed in a cell. So what we did with this one is we are actually using a ribosome-associated RNA. We are tagging the RNA, so the, the ribosome, so we can pull it down with the RNA associated with it. So in essence, we are taking this ribosome and grabbing it with that RNA as a proxy for what the proteins are. In addition to that, we're doing the total mRNA and we're doing the small RNAs so that we can look at not only what RNAs are being formed, but which ones are potentially going to proteins and which ones are being chewed up and what that regulatory mechanism might be. That's the basis for this. And this will be the most complete regulatory uh, gene expression experiment that has ever flown. So the treatments, we're gonna have one abo above, huh, aboard ISS, and then of course the ground control. So that we can see what differences there are in gene regulation in flight versus on the ground. You're gonna notice that I'm say in flight quite often, not in zero gravity. There is no zero gravity. It's referred to as microgravity because there's always some pull on things, so microgravity. But when we do space flight, it's not just microgravity. There's radiation, there's other environmental factors. So when we look at these gene expressions, we're really looking at the difference between the entire space flight environment and on Earth. If you have, if you have questions, you can stop me and derail me at any moment. Definition phase, that's step two. You get the grant. The first thing you have to do with NASA is define the experiment, definition phase. This is Al Myers, my postdoc at the time, he was still a grad student. He helped with the writing of this grant and was part of the collaboration. And then of course, COVID hit and labs were shut down and we all went home. Well, Al took our lab home with him so that he could continue to do the definition phase. Definition phase was really about defining how we would grow the seedlings. So he could grow seedlings at home, right? So he took everything home. This is his apartment. And this is him working in his apartment. He's very energetic. So he did multiple experiments, tested multiple things, and we actually, he defined all of the ex experimental parameters. You know, even though in a grant, we d I had done what we anticipated doing, space flight is different from other experiments. It's different in the fact that most of the time when you do experiments, you do an experiment, sort of like cooking, you do an experiment, and you go, that didn't quite work right, I don't really like that, so you redo it. You can't do that with flight. NASA wants to know if they're going to spend the money to launch your experiment, that it's probably going to work right the first time. We'll talk more about that in a minute. <laughs> Working right the first time. The second step is the science verification test. This is a mini test, it's done down at Kennedy. So we got back into the lab, which was fantastic. And what you can see here, Al's working again, back in the lab. Testing again how we're plating the seeds. You might actually be able to see it. Can you guys see the little seeds going across the plate at the top, right here? Yes, no, maybe. They're really small. Uh, if you didn't see them outside, these are Arabidopsis seed. This container, there's probably 20,000 Arabidopsis seed in there. Yeah, here. They're not gonna bite you. <laughs> Pass them around and get a look at how small these seed are. 
And then, once we had everything prepped and ready to go, we went down to Kennedy. Kennedy, of course, is also on lockdown. So, of course, we had to have special permission to travel out of Ohio, special permission to travel into Kennedy. The space station or the um, space center is on lockdown, so they're on essential personnel only. So none of the places to eat are open. None of the places to buy anything is open. Sarah, yes. Get a chance to have your first question. Let's go. What is a rabidopsis? <laughs> what is a rabidopsis? I say that so quickly. A rabidopsis, uh, we've got a picture of one in a few minutes. So a rabidopsis is a very small plant that is the model system for plant research. So when you think about animal research, maybe you know Drosophila, the fruit fly, is used for a lot of genetic work. Maybe you know about using mice for human studies. A rabidopsis is kind of that small, spindly little plant that we can use, and it's really small, and that makes it really useful in flight because we can grow hundreds of them, quite literally, in a really small, confined space. International Space Station. This is the building where they built the International Space Station, which makes it cool in and of itself. Social distancing, one alligator apart, please. This is our lab. Again, Al doing all the work. I don't really do anything except take pictures, right? That's all I did. Um, at the end of SVT, or EVT, um, we actually have to collect data. This is SVT. We actually collect data. This is, these are the types of things where we have objectives, many objectives for that experiment, that set of experiments, and we build various reports to show that using these techniques, we can get really good germination, we can get the roots the, long, the length we want them, we can get really good RNA out of it. So to be sure that, again, our experiment's going to work or as sure as you can be. The next step in the process, so I submit all the paperwork to NASA. NASA says, very good, we'll go on to EVT. So this is just basically a bigger version of SVT in some regards. We did 60 plates. The way these were plated, you can see this, there's a membrane here so that we can dissect the seedlings when we bring it back. And we, and when I say we, I mean Al, um, plated the individual seeds across the top, and then we took those down to Kennedy. Back to Kennedy. There's really not a downside to going to Kennedy, even with all the stuff closed. Um, back to the lab. Here's our lab again. I love the little welcome to your lab, Apex 7. This is November of 2020. Everything's still pretty much locked down, right? There's the little seeds on the plate. And there's the 12-day-old Arabidopsis. Okay, so that's how big we want them. That's how big, and when you look at this plate, these are the plates, so they are just this long, okay? And that's okay. We'll get there. So then we get to flight. So next step is flight. When we get to flight, we have more how it joins us. We've realized there are some researchers at Texas that would really like to use flight material. If anybody has any extra. You don't usually have flight material that's extra. But we thought we might, and it's, uh, they want to look at telomere length. Because for humans, telomere length extends when the astronauts are flying. So when they did the twin study, they noticed that Mark's telomeres were longer than his brother's. Okay? 
So they wanted to see if that's going to be something that's universal and in plants. I thought this was the coolest thing on the planet. So <laughs> it's like, OK, or maybe even out of this world, shall I say. So come on. You can at least sigh when I do these really terrible jokes. Come on, get with me. So back to Kennedy we go. There we are again. You notice, I don't know if you've noticed or not, this case is a case that we bring down with us. In the early experiments, there's like two stickers on it. Now look at them. We got stickers everywhere. So they're building. Again, back to plating. These are pretty mundane things around the lab. We're going to plate these things. We're going to seed them. We're going to package them. This time, we're going to package them for flight. This is flight. You can see the little green sticker that says flight. Very high tech. Yes. But so you see all the plates. We wrap them in foil. And then we unwrapped them again because NASA forgot they wanted us to put a sticker on them, <laughs> each plate. So that was fun. Um, and then we put them in these little custom blue bags. These were designed specifically for our experiment. They hold two racks. Each one of those uh, aluminum foil bags holds 10 plates. Each plate holds 15 seed, so there's 150 seed per slot. So these guys are going to be closed up, put on cold. These are cold bags. They're going to be put in the cold and handed over to the flight people. So this is the big day. We're going to hand them over, and then they're going to fly. Sarah, I have another question. Let's go for it. S sorry for the lag uh, on the chat. What's a telomere? Can you? Oh. <laughs> See, that's why you all need to ask questions, because it's not just you. Somebody else next to you probably has the same question. Hopefully not somebody in my lab. But it could happen. So the telomeres, on the ends of your chromosomes, you have straight linear chromosomes. On the end of your chromosomes is DNA that is very repetitive and quite extensive. And those are the telomeres. So they're the ends of your chromosomes, and they protect your chromosomes from being chewed up. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, flight. This is some of the crew from Kennedy out with me. Al's family came down, so he was watching the uh, flight off base. This is our view. You notice the big yellow, yellow uh, barriers? We're not allowed to go past those. They told us explicitly we could not go to the grandstands. You see the grandstands? Who puts grandstands on the other side of the barrier? And then tells people they can't go. OK, so everybody take a breath. You ready? Keep an eye on it. It's right here. Not right here, on the right. It was a really windy day, so you get a lot of the wind. This never gets old for me. I don't care how many I've seen. You notice all the people on the grandstands? There it goes. I'm telling you, it never gets old. Now, you see all the smoke? Oh. Yeah, now comes the sound. And that's the delay. That's the roar coming at you. And you can feel it, not just hear it. You want to see it again? One more time. You know you want to. My experiment is on that rocket. <laughs> Al worked really hard for that to happen.
Um, uh, he wants to know how many other experiments were on the rocket. I'm not really sure, but there were like five or six, somewhere in that range. Eight. Whoa. Yeah, now comes the sound and the feel. I've probably only watched this, I don't know, a hundred times. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, uh, this is the Dragon capsule. Once it gets up there, you see the Canada arm. That's a mechanical, me mechanical arm from ISS that comes out and grabs the capsule and brings it in to dock. Now it's docked at ISS. At this point, the astronauts go, astronauts go out and open the hatches and bring the equipment, materials. This is a resupply mission, so they bring all of the materials in, and the Dragon stays there for about a month. This is an important piece of information, the about a month, because whatever experiment you fly is going to be up at least that long if you get to come down on the same one you went up on. That's important on how long you wait. Once we were up, this is Thomas Pesquet. He is the astronaut who loaded our experiments into the hardware. The hardware is called the veggie unit. This is our simulation of the veggie unit, which is actually fairly accurate. We use this for outreach, for education, and uh, sometimes uh, Elementary school kids or high school kids can do experiments and these kinds of things. These are the kinds of things you can set up which really aren't that much different environmentally than what you would have on ISS. Also, if you remember, we had the plates, right? So they all sit in what is really a standard uh, petri um, centrifuge rack, centrifuge tube rack. So these go in, uh, again, we had 60 plates, and you can see them over here on the right, in the veggie unit. You will notice the red color before somebody asks. The majority of the veggie, they don't use white light, per se. They actually use red and blue light, uh, and they look very red in almost every photograph. There's less heat, they use LEDs, there's less heat, but plants really are really using red light for the majority anyway. Now, this was June 14th. What happens with the ground controls? These are the ground controls at Kennedy. He's giving me the thumbs up, he's finished, finally. Right? He's <laughs> It does take them a while to do these things, and the astronauts are great about it, sitting and doing each one of these plates and being sure they're all in place exactly right. So the ground controls are in an environmental chamber at Kennedy Space Center. They are under the environmental conditions that are downloaded from ISS. So they're on a two-day delay, a 48-hour delay. You can see this was done on the 16th, so two days later, they set them all up, and they're downloading environmental information from ISS to run the chambers. Okay, now it's been 14 days, which was what we had wanted, 12 days. This was 14th to 26th. So what we're gonna show, what I wanna show you now is harvest. So when you look at this, in a minute I'll remember his name, I swear. Um, you have an aluminum foil packet up here. You see the aluminum foil? And he's getting this ready. What you're gonna notice, we're gonna show you a video in a minute. What you're gonna notice is every once in a while stuff sort of moves. Everything on ISS, of course, it's in microgravity. So there's no gravity to hold the plates down. So they have to put everything on little Velcro, 
or taped down so that it doesn't all just float away. Mark Vandehey. So he just finished one, and now he's going to do the next one. There's only 60 of these to do. You can start your watch now and figure out how long this would take. We are actually watching this live. There is a live feed going down to Kennedy. And then the people at Kennedy are actually pointing their cameras, their laptop at it, and zooming us. So we're seeing the live feed as it comes down. You know, you always think that if I could just get it off the ground, the build up, I mean, it took almost two years to get it ready to fly. And then it goes up, and it's so exciting. And then the next thing in your mind is, what if they don't germinate? They germinated. <laughs> so they had sent us some pictures, so we did know that they were going well. So he's taking pictures of each plate before he wraps it up. Now, he's handing off to Megan MacArthur, the other astronaut assigned to this project. Oops. Sarah, you have another question. Okay. The astronauts who are on mission, what degrees do they have? Are they biologists? Some are biologists, some are not. Most, many are engineers. Uh, they are actually trained. They have very detailed protocols on how they're supposed to do these things. Checklist manifesto, here we go. They have very clear checklists. Uh, they're all trained. They have diagrams and, you know, this is exactly where you want it. You're going to fold it exactly this way. So we watched three hours of folding. Every one of them was exciting. Are you kidding me? Three hours. But um, he did every one of them just exactly the same. They really care a lot about the experiments. They're sort of excited about it, and they're living organisms, which they really enjoy working with. Uh, that's one of the things about the veggie unit. Uh, the veggie unit is also used to grow what they call pick and eat crops. So they've been doing a lot of salad types of crops in the veggie for them. And one of the things that they found was that the astronauts didn't want to just send them home. They wanted to eat them. So they got it approved for them to eat it. So now anything that flies the salad crops that fly in veggie for experiments they get to eat half. And then they have to send the other half home for the researchers. Uh, this is Megan MacArthur. She's actually putting the samples into the minus 80 freezer. Minus 80 centigrade freezer that's on ISS. So our samples were folded up and put in the minus 80 freezer, and that's what's going to preserve them until they come home. Okay. She got the uh, job of running back and forth to the minus 80. Um, I don't actually know like the capacity. Um, certainly it was big enough to hold, you know, 60 plates. Um, and I know there's a lot of other materials in it as well. I don't actually know the capacity. Day for return. Y'all read that. <laughs> um, so it was coming back down. It was on the same flight. So remember that month? So we've been waiting. They've been in the freezer, right? So it takes 12 days for them to grow. They've been in the freezer for the other 20 or so days. And they're coming home. I thought it was a given. Who'd have funk it, right? So all of a sudden, 
is a Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon about 4.30. Isn't that where all the bad news comes out? So Jared is calling me, texting me, get, leaving phone messages. I'm at the pool. It's Friday afternoon. He's also calling Al, texting Al. Call me as soon as you get this. So this is the text that I got from him. I didn't actually read this first because he was calling me, so I answered the phone. When NASA calls you at 4.30 on a Friday, and Al and I were like, but Dragon's already left. What could go wrong? Well, everybody has to make the flight, right? So what happened was 24 of the samples they found on ISS 14 hours after the dragon had left. So the um, minus 80 freezer on ISS, all the samples had to be taken out of that and then put into the minus 80 freezer on the dragon to come back home. Some of them didn't make the ship. So we lost 24. So he's, you know, he's on the phone with me. He said, what do you want us to do with them? And I said, I, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, can you just put them back in the freezer? Let me think about this. I mean, these are things that we've spent all this time and effort on, right? And he said, well, you know, and if you can get the science, you know, can you still get the science? Is this, you know, going to be a total loss of the experiment? And honestly, I'm thinking, um, I don't know. So we were trying to consider what kind of experiment could we get out of these samples if they brought them down the next flight. And then finally decided that the only experiment we could really do would be how much damage this caused. And that's probably not an experiment worth bringing anybody down for because the reality is they don't want this to ever happen again. They don't want to know, you know what that time frame is. So I finally just told them that uh, they could trash them. We did get our other samples back. So, the summary, definition phase, science, experiment verification, pre-flight sample prep, the launch, seedling growth. Sample return was a bit of a problem. However, refly. NASA has offered us a refly of the total mission. Um, so we will be reflying that mission in December. Right now, the launch is slated for December 21. What are you laughing about? <laughs> the last time I had a launch that was scheduled right before Christmas, it was in January. So that's okay. So with that, I'm going to leave you guys with my favorite quote. Remember the seed in the styrofoam cup? Every one of you have planted one. The roots go down, the shoots go up. Maybe it was a paper cup. And nobody really knows how or why. So Robert Fulgham, all I really need to know, I learned in kindergarten. For those of you that have seen me speak before, you know I use this quote at the end of every single talk. It explains the entirety <laughs> of my science career. <laughs> we still don't know. We learned, we've learned so much over the last 20 years, so much with the flight experiments. But we still really don't fully understand how plants respond to gravity, except that the shoots go up and the roots go down almost exclusively. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. So, do we have questions from the audience here? Okay, let me try and come over and give you a microphone. Hey, Rito. So, I, I don't know how fertile the soil is in the extraterrestrial planets, but if plants grow in space, how would they grow? Like in a hydroponic system? Or how would you envision them growing into well, full-fledged plants? That's one of the real questions about how do we want to do that. Hydroponically doesn't really work well because there's no gravity to hold the water down, right? You, you can't imagine, oh, well, I'll just pour water on my plant. Water's not going down, right? So the hydroponics, it would have to be a closed system of any sort. 
Um, the way we grow these are in auger. Uh, the veggie itself, when it's growing vegetable crops, they have these, um, they have two or three different variants of them, but they're basically kind of squares and they're enclosed packets. It's not packets of dirt, but they're, they're enclosed packets so that the roots can grow into it. And the directionality winds up being mostly based on light. When you take gravity out of the mix, plants respond even stronger to light. And the roots don't like light, and the shoots go up. So you get them to grow relatively in the direction you would like them to grow. Pillows, pillows. pillows. thank you, soil pillows. Um, so your logo for the Wyatt Lab, does that have direct correlation to the quote that you just shared with the arrow going up and down, or is that completely separate? No, that's to be gravity. Okay, good. That was, okay. That was my intent when I designed it. Okay, perfect. It was, yeah. uh, my other question has to do with um, the experiences that you had on like an emotional level. Every time that you checked off one of those dots, you know, I mean, that's just a cause for celebration mm -hmm. um, throughout the process. Well, we celebrate every time. Yeah, and so... <laughs> Um, which one would you think would be the most meaningful for you as you reflect back on it? Of those particular steps? Yeah, if you had to pick one area of the process. Because usually the most excited I am and the most emotional I am is when we get the data back at the end. <laughs> and it's, we have data, now we have something to work with. It's yet to come. Yet to come. Uh, that's why, you know, so when we weren't sure we would get a refly, or we might only get a partial refly. So, you know, there's a lot of tension in there about, well, okay, what, what are we doing? It, you know, how did this happen? Can we prevent this? What, and you know, and NASA's really upset about it. And NASA does a great job of, if it's not their fault, I mean, if it's not my fault, you know, if, it's, if the experiment fails because the plants didn't grow well enough, they might try, but with something like this where there clearly was an accident on ISS, then they want to uh, refly and live up to their promise of an experiment. So they did a fantastic job with that. Sarah, I have a question for you. Actually, two. Um, one, that was really amazing. Lots of exclamation points. <laughs> How can students join your team? And the other one, what agar did you use? What? Agar. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, it's standard MS, half MS agar. Very standard, uh, 1%. Um, as far as how people can get involved in my lab, that only usually takes an email or uh, drop by the lab kind of thing. Okay, and uh, another question. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to understand what they're, what they're saying here. Oh, I got it. Were you able to donate samples to, for the telomere experiment? Yes. So one of the, one of the uh, perks of this is 24 samples were lost, but we still had 38, right? So we still had samples that came down from space. And of course, we have all the ground controls, which are not terribly helpful. But the fact that we did have some kind of leaves us more room to be able to do something like that, the telomere experiment. So now we're also thinking about what can we do with those samples? We can't really use them in comparison with the new flight because it will be different. They're not gonna be exactly the same. Um, but we can certainly compare them. We have the ground controls. We can certainly use them. We just can't use them for our original purpose because there's not enough of them. Does that make sense? But yeah, so we're constantly, they're all in the minus 80. And I actually didn't add that to the thing. Um, one of the things I like best is when you get samples back, they come in cardboard boxes with a, all kinds of dry ice and this really cool NASA sticker that says critical space item. I love these guys. This is not one that came back on the box. I cut them all off the box because uh, I don't know, that's stupid. But they sent me a bunch of others because it's like, oh, I really like those. <laughs> Do, yeah. Over there. Hi, John. Wow. 
It was great, and thank you. In terms of the telomere length, you mentioned the two twin brothers, the one in space and one on the mm -hmm. ground. If I understood it correctly, the one in space had longer telomeres than had the one on the ground. Had longer telomeres, yes. A and do you think that's because they were there was less action in terms of shortening them? They certainly didn't grow in space. No. Yeah. We, yeah, so the thing is, telomeres don't get longer. They just don't right. get shorter, right? Uh, and they actually have no idea yet. Uh, they weren't able to do like the assays, telomerase assays, those kinds of things with the samples, so they don't know. And that's one of the things that we may be able to address with the plants because we may have enough material to be able to look at the enzymes as well. Okay, so um, yeah, that, that was part of the twin study. It was one piece of it, and it hasn't really been explored much yet. Hi, Sana. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. So you mentioned that the, your, your plants, the, the, the shoot likes light, the root does not like light. Do you think there's an uh, influence of light on the gravity tropism? Of course. I think gravity, gravity affects plants, light affects plants. You all know phototropism, you know, shoots move towards light. Um, it's an interplay between the two on Earth. You can't really get a plant to grow upside down. You can put it upside down, but you can't put a light under it and actually get it to grow down because it knows it should go up, right? Plants evolved on Earth with gravity, so they use gravity. I mean, that idea of, I usually use this early on, but that piece of you've all planted a seed, right? Did you plant it right side up? Exactly. You didn't have to plant it right side up. The seedling knows which way to go. And that's gravity. Now, you'll see a lot of weeping trees and stuff now, these horticultural plants. What you will notice with most of the weeping trees, I love looking at them all, um, is they often have a graft point. If you have a weeping tree that is weeping that's got such a defect in the gravity response that it weeps, the roots are probably doing the wrong thing too. So they graft that shoot onto a normal root stock because the plant can't survive unless the roots go down. Uh, so you'll see a lot of that. There are natural mutants that have evolved, like the weeping willows, that do weep, that just the shoots weep. Very interestingly, in plants, a gravity defect, a gravity defect can, a can affect the roots, the shoots, and the inflorescent stems. Or... It could be a defect that only affects the inflorescent stems. You see a lot of crop plants where the plant bends over. We, we've domesticated plants to use gravity to our advantage for harvest, quite honestly. You know, nice, straight, tall things that we can get to. But you'll see these little odd pieces to the effects of gravity. It could affect the roots, but not the shoot. Could affect the shoots, but not the roots. So there's a lot of variation in how plants affect, are affected by gravity that leads to that resilience of plants and using gravity to really um, survive. Any more questions? Rox, do you have any questions coming we over there? we got one down front. Um, I understand that the refly is likely to be just a, a replication of the previous experiment. However, what sort of variations do you plan on future flights, if, you know, planning on future flights? I'm already, so he asked about future flights. He knows the reflight. The reflight will be exactly what we've done before because that's what we're approved to do, okay? Uh, you can't really change things once you've gotten through all the, the steps unless there's a really good reason. Um, I'm already thinking about what the next grant is, whether it's to NASA or someone else, um, following up on some of the previous findings. So the BRIC-20 experiment, we still have the PGP. If you walk down the thing, you heard something about those two experiments. And then APEX-7, once we find these things, we want to be able to follow up, not just keep flying these big experiments, but 
following up on specific genes or specific types of regulation. This is all about gene regulation, which I find fascinating. So I want to follow up on this. We have an opportunity here to look at gene regulation that we couldn't look at any other way. Um, and how plants respond to gravity, that difference, even if it is space flight environment, most of that is gravity or microgravity. So being able to understand better how that works. Plants probably have at least two systems that perceive gravity for backup. Sarah, I have a question for you. Assuming you get your samples this time from reflight. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Um, how That's do you get them? Do they FedEx them? Uh, they actually ship them back. Uh, the first time they ship them back on a FedEx truck that was a single drive. So they, they left Kennedy and did one straight drive back here. There were two drivers. Uh, this last one, they actually shipped through one of the other FedEx. So they box them all up in dry ice. And the boxes are usually like this big. But you need a lot of dry ice to make sure that they don't. But they're always shipped back priority um, so that you get them back quickly. Because the last thing you want is for something to happen in shipping and you lose your samples because they didn't get from Kennedy to Ohio. That would be a true disaster. Not coming back from space. I can get that. That can happen. But you know, for some shipping thing and it winds up sitting on a dock somewhere, um, they work really hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Remind me, wasn't it the first shipment where something odd happened? Was there a blizzard or? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. So when, when I refer to the, the first experiment is Brick 20. That's the hardware and it was the 20th experiment in the hardware. Um, when Brick 20 came back, they called me and they said, we're about an hour out. Two hours later, I'm still looking for them. And we had this freak blizzard hit. We canceled the cafe that night. It was a Wednesday. We canceled the cafe because there was so much snow on the ground. And these guys said, we got trapped. You know, there was all this snow just piling down. But they still got there. It was only a couple hours delayed. Any more questions? If not, I'd like to uh, thank Sarah again for a very thank entertaining you. talk. Stay tuned for announcements for next year's Science Cafes. Thank and you. If you guys would like to stop by and talk to my students as you go out about those experiments or see what different kinds of things are going on, please do. They're all trying to figure out what to say. <laughs>